Good evening. I am John Burkhalter, and along with my esteemed colleague, harpsichordist Donovan Klotzbeacher, we are the Practitioners of Music. Our virtual entertainment, entitled Nothing More Agreeable, Music in the Washington Family, is sponsored by the Rockingham Association on behalf of Rockingham State Historic Site in Kingston, New Jersey, Washington's final wartime headquarters in 1783, and is made possible with the generous assistance of the William Trent House Association, Trenton, New Jersey. In a document dated June 4, 1777, General Washington wrote, nothing is more agreeable and ornamental than good music. This concert with commentary will thus explore the agreeable and remarkable musical world of three select generations of the extended Washington family. The general, whilst a fine dancer and avid theater goer, is not known to have played a musical instrument of any sort. Yet he and Martha, a woman of privilege and wealth, who had received harpsichord lessons, well understood the value of music and dance as a social grace, and saw to it that the children under their care received a thorough musical education as well. Global trade is the thread that connects the Washingtons, their friends and associates, and a significant fueling aspect of this global trade was, in humanitarian terms, the regressive slave trade. The wealth accrued from the slave trade was channeled into the social fabric of the elite and gentry. Music, instrumental and singing, and dance were also part of the enslaved and free black experience and will be addressed as well. The first part, music for Martha Dandridge Custis, 1731 to 1802. Later married on January 6, 1759, George Washington, 1732, 1799, and was his worthy partner for almost 40 years. Again, may we note the year 1759, and this brings to mind the fact that this is a period when he was militarily engaged with British forces fighting the French during the Seven Years' War, or French and Indian War, in North America. The capture of Quebec in 1759 from the French by General Wolfe was a victory that led to British supremacy in Canada. The same year the French were also routed in the West Indies, and with the defeat of the French in India in 1760, Britain became a global power and master of the world. The old barracks museum in Trenton is the only surviving barracks built during the French and Indian War. Ironically, British victories in North America would lead to frayed relations with the American colonies, setting the stage for the Revolutionary War and Washington's pivotal role in the conflict. Three melodies to be heard are linked to the bullfinch or favorite English song set to music and sung at the public theaters and gardens published in two parts by Baldwin and Wilkie, London, circa 1757. Martha Washington's copy of the bullfinch is inscribed on the title page, Martha Washington, 1759, in the hand of George Washington. The book is actually a songster or a collection of myriad lyrics, poetry to popular songs highlighting thoughts of love and pastoral idylls, but without the actual music, in fact. Often, as in Martha Washington's copy, Songsters will not identify the tune or even the composer associated with the poetry, so accordingly it takes due diligence to find the proper match by doing a first line search and also having a very broad knowledge of the repertory. The purpose of Songster is simply to provide private delight. Given her position and station in elite society, it would have been natural to have attained a respectable level of genteel musical attainment, perhaps as a singer, but more likely she was most at home playing a harpsichord. We open with rural Britannia with music, circa 1740 by Thomas Augustine Arne, composed to verse by poet James Thompson.
The following tunes from the Playhouse stage work, The Beggar's Opera. John Gay wrote this play, first performed in London in 1728. Known as the greatest theatrical success of the 18th century, the play took a satirical look at politics and Italian opera and used recognizable tunes with new lyrics sung by, among others, pickpockets, thieves, scoundrels, and other lesser sorts, as well as characters in thinly disguised portrayals of divas and politicians. The first known staging of the ballad opera in Williamsburg, colonial capital of Virginia, was June 3, 1768, a performance the Washingtons might just have attended. The following air is taken from George Bickham's Musical Entertainer that appears listed in a prominent Williamsburg inventory of 1755. The songs in Bickham's magnificently produced volume reflect contemporary musical taste and trends in London. Many airs are ascribed to specific poets and composers, a few of whom are exceedingly well known, notably Purcell and Handel. You will hear Request to a Nightingale or the Musette in Mr. Handel's opera, his magic opera called Alcina. From the Robert Bremner harpsichord or spinet miscellany, this minuet is a piece of modest technical difficulty and likely the sort of music Martha Washington could play readily and effectively in pursuit of social harmony. <laughs> Thank you. 
The second part. Music for Martha Park Custis, called Patsy. Daughter of Martha Dandridge Custis, whose brief life, clearly filled with an abiding joy of music, was beset, alas, with chronic illness. She suffered from epilepsy. Despite seeking the best treatments available, Patsy died in the summer of 1773. She was only 17. George Washington ordered a spinet from the workshop of John Planius and had it duly shipped to Virginia from London in 1762 for Martha Park Custis. You will hear music taken from the Robert Bremner harpsichord or spinet miscellany again, circa 1765, in a copy owned by Martha Park Custis and dated January the 19th, 1769. This copy is now in the Fred W. Smith Library Special Collections of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Robert Bremner's harpsichord or spinet miscellany is one of the best of the many collections of popular keyboard music that were printed in London and quickly exported to the American colonies. Keyboard collections like this were commercial items published to be sold at a profit to a mass audience for study and play at home, featuring minuets and other dances, folk songs, grounds, and other types of variation sets, some by well-known composers of the day. And as my late friend James Jock Darling, former director of music for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and organist at Bruton Parish Church, loved to say of Bremner's collection, charm and delight may be called the essential ingredients of the music.
music now from a manuscript owned by Martha Park Custis with an inscription on the flyleaf, Martha Park Custis, March 1768, in the hand of George Washington, also in special collections, the Fred Smith Library, Mount Vernon Ladies Association. You will hear the sixth Earl of Kelly's Minuet, composed by Thomas Erskine, a Scottish nobleman and Scotland's most illustrious musician. This will be followed by Lovely Nancy, a favorite air composed by James Oswald, another prominent Scots composer. <laughs> Oswald was a friend of music-loving Benjamin Franklin when the latter returned to London in 1757, the most famous American in the world, a veritable polymath, staying until 1775 as the representative of the Assembly of Pennsylvania. Franklin, by the way, had first visited London as a teenage printer in the mid-1720s and stayed for 18 months. Barbarina's Minuet named after the celebrated virtuoso dancer Barbarina, Countess de Campanini. The minuet is the final movement of a string concerto, Opus 1, Number 1, composed by Johann Otto Hasse, arranged for organ or harpsichord. His music was enormously popular during his lifetime. Its chief characteristics were melodic beauty and formal balance. And Hasse was married to Faustina Bordoni, who was one of the great divas in the London stage and sang frequently for Mr. Handel.
More now from the Robert Bremner harpsichord or spinet miscellany. The following compositions are variation sets. From the harpsichord vocal score of Love in a Village, 
also in the Fred W. Smith Library Special Collections, Mount Vernon Ladies Association. This volume bears the inscription Martha Park Custis, February the 9th, 1773. A musical theater production by Thomas Augustine Arne, Love in a Village, first produced in London in 1762, was also presented in the American colonies by traveling theatrical companies, and the music was widely available. Jefferson actually owned a copy of the harpsichord vocal score, and it is likely both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson saw the play when performed in Williamsburg on May 1st, 1771. Now listen to the Gavata, a lively dance form of French origin, in the overture of Love in a Village, composed by Charles Frederick Abel, who in fact was a music master to Queen Charlotte, consort of George III. The third part, music for Nellie Park Custis Lewis, 1779 to 1852, the granddaughter of Martha Dandridge Custis and step-granddaughter of General Washington, not legally adopted by General Washington, so she retained the Custis surname. Repertory will be taken from a number of sources, including a bound volume of manuscript and printed sheet music at the Smith Library Special Collection, Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And there's an inscription on the flyleaf, Eleanor Park Custis, February 25th, 1797. We will hear the Scots Ground. Nellie's manuscript copy of the Scots Ground, taken from Bremner's harpsichord or spinet miscellany with her fingerings and other markings in the music, clearly defined, offers a portal into the world of 18th century performance. <laughs> Thank you. 
Repertory taken from two bound volumes of manuscript and plate printed music at the Houghton Library, Harvard University. The second volume is inscribed on the front flyleaf, Eleanor Park Custis, February 25th, 1797. From the first volume, we will hear an esteemed work from the quill of Alexander Reinigal. Within a few years of settling in Philadelphia from London, Reinigal supervised the construction of a new state-of-the-art theater on Chestnut Street, a venue frequented by President George Washington, who had a love of the theater that was almost insatiable. The president, and with no doubt the approbation of the first first lady, Martha Washington, engaged Reinigal, already a celebrated keyboard performer and composer in 1789, to teach Nellie the rudiments of music and graded keyboard skills on a pianoforte after Martha Park Custis's old spinet had been traded in for the newly popular instrument made in New York City by Thomas Dodds, and in fact is similar to an instrument circa 1791-92 in the musical instrument collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Martha, Nellie's grandmother, in a letter dated June 8, 1789, wrote, Nellie shall begin music next week. From Alexander Reinigal's edition, a selection of the most favorite Scots tunes with variations for the pianoforte or harpsichord, you will hear from that same quill I mentioned earlier, the East Nook of Fife, published in a Philadelphia edition, 1786-1787. Surprisingly, in 1793, George Washington acquired a large English harpsichord for his 14-year-old step-granddaughter. Under Reinigal's instruction, she was already a veteran performer. Of the several musical instruments that graced the presidential mansion in Philadelphia and later Mount Vernon, none was more grand or impressive than this harpsichord. The instrument was ordered from Longman and Broderip, the largest firm of music merchants in London. The import certificate for one case containing a harpsichord valued at 77 pounds, seven shillings and five pence was docketed September 30th, 1793 and arrived at the executive mansion in Philadelphia in the immediate aftermath of the yellow fever pandemic that ravaged Philadelphia with a vengeance in 1793. Those who could, including the president and family and cabinet fled the city to destinations in the healthier countryside like Germantown. Among those who remained, the fever claimed an estimated 5,000 lives out of a population of some 50,000 inhabitants. Mindful of mitigation, other American cities embargoed the nation's capital, fearful that traffic from Philadelphia could introduce the infection. Nellie's harpsichord eventually moved with the family when they returned to Mount Vernon. The original harpsichord is now on display in the museum at Mount Vernon. A replica built by John Watson, a former curator of musical instruments for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, is now in the small parlor of the house today and regularly used in public programming. The music played and heard in Philadelphia and later at Mount Vernon ran the gamut from A to Z of airs from ballad operas by Thomas Arne, Samuel Arnold, and William Shield, amongst others suitably arranged in play-at-home editions. 
harpsichord vocal scores, to, to sonatas by the most esteemed masters of the day. Among the famed and favorite airs Nellie played were those taken from theatrical works by William Shield. Shield wrote a string of successful operas and pantomimes. The most popular were afterpieces. For example, Rosina of 1782, The Poor Soldier, 1783, and The Farmer a few years later in 1787. Washington attended performances of Rosina and The Poor Soldier at Reiningle's Chestnut Street Theater and enjoyed the music in Nellie's performances of hits from the shows in literally from playhouse to your house settings. from accounts from visitors to the house overlooking the Potomac, Nellie was a sublime mistress at the keyboard, providing salubrious and felicitous entertainment to the delight of her grandparents and important guests. One such guest in 1798, a Polish nobleman, wrote, her sweetness is next to her beauty, and this being so perfect in form, possesses all the talents. She plays the harpsichord, sings, and draws better than any woman in America or even Europe. From a catalog of Thomas Birch's sons, auctioneers in Philadelphia, dated December 1890, that listed a now lost volume of music belonging to Eleanor Park Custis containing the Battle of Trenton, dedicated to General Washington, composed by James Hewitt. Hewitt was renowned for the Battle of Trenton, a keyboard sonata written in 1797 and as mentioned, dedicated to George Washington. The sonata contains numerous short sections with descriptive titles possibly performed with the narrator or the player speaking to highlight the programmatic storyline, such as the army in motion, attack, cannons, bomb, flight of the Hessians, trumpets of victory, and so forth, including one section using the tune Yankee Doodle. The most elegiac moment in the sonata is entitled 
grief of the Americans for the loss of their comrades killed in the engagement. For this emotional moment, Hewitt chose the haunting Scots heir, Roslyn Castle, with the passage in this sonata marked Lento con Expressione. You will hear the heir, Roslyn Castle, taken from the Battle of Trenton, composed by James Hewitt. From the second volume at the Houghton Library, Harvard University, we will hear the President's March, composed by Philip File, circa 1734-1793, who was a Hessian musician captured at the Battle of Trenton in 1776. File remained in America following the Revolutionary War and was active in music theater both in Philadelphia and later New York City. The march was said to have been played for Washington as president-elect on the occasion of his second coming to Trenton on April 21st, 1789, as he made his progress to Federal Hall in New York City to be inaugurated as the first president of the United States. Joseph Hopkinson, son of New Jersey signer of the Declaration of Independence, Francis Hopkinson, arranged the march, set words, lyrics to the march, and titled it as Hail Columbia, the favorite new federal song adapted to the President's March, and in this format was first performed in the Chestnut Street Theater in Philadelphia, April 25, 1798, in essence, our first national anthem. Nellie's handwritten copy of Hopkinson's text is also in the collection of the Houghton Library, Harvard University. Now the rousing President's March by Philip File. The fourth part, special music and dance dedicated to George and Martha Washington. Francis Hopkinson prepared a volume of songs, the words and music he composed and published in Philadelphia, November 20th, 1788. 
and dedicated to his friend, His Excellency George Washington Esquire. Hopkinson's forward includes the following. However small the reputation may be that I shall derive from this work, I cannot, I believe, be refused the credit of being the first native of the United States who has produced a musical composition. If this attempt should not be too severely treated, others may be encouraged to venture on a path yet untrodden in America, and the arts in succession will take root and flourish amongst us. Hopkinson sent a presentation copy to Washington, who in response to the dedication wrote, what alas can I do to support it? I can neither sing nor raise a note on any instrument to convince the unbelieving. We hear for instrumental setting, My Love Has Gone to Sea by Francis Hopkinson. Dance. 1788 is also the year Nellie and her brother John Park Custis called Washi, who played German flute and violin, were instructed in dancing. As my late colleague Kate Keller, a renowned scholar of dance in 18th century America, commented on the dances of Washington's time, social dance is a complex topic depending on such variables as venue and social standing of the participants. Two dance types, the French minuet and the English country dance, were the staples of dance assemblies in purpose-built tavern ballrooms or commodious space in grand city and country residences, such as the Governor's Palace or the Apollo Room within the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg, venues known to Washington as a member of the House of Burgesses. The formal minuet was the most important dance of refined ritual and ceremony while the country dance, a group dance, was not rigidly codified and arranged for as many couples as will standing in lines, partners facing each other and progressing in various lengthwise patterns or figures. Balls were splendid and festive occasions to see and be seen on the dance floor. Washington, before, during, and after the Revolutionary War, enjoyed dance assemblies, and it was noted that he was conspicuous for his graceful and elegant dancing of the minuet. Given his stature and popularity, it was a fitting tribute that social dances would be associated, named in honor of both General, President, and Mrs. Washington. The earliest dance actually named for Washington was printed in England in 1785 from the London dance master James Fisher's collection of minuets, cotillions, and country dances, etc. You will now hear the Washington country dance from Fisher's collection. With his military experience from serving during the American Revolution as a member of Washington's staff, the 32-year-old Marquis de Lafayette 
quickly assumed a prominent role in the opening chapter of the French Revolution. The day after the Bastille fell on July 14, 1789, liberating a famed musician, Monsieur Dupart, Lafayette was placed in command of a local National Guard formed to keep order throughout France and given the main prison key. Lafayette was optimistic about the fate of the revolution when he prepared to ship the Bastille key to George Washington in March of 1790. The key to the Bastille prison hangs in the central hall of Mount Vernon. Pierre Langrand Duport, dancing master and composer, left France three days after the fall of the Bastille, and after a stay in Dublin, where we believe he knew Gilbert Stuart, emigrated in 1790 to Philadelphia, where he became associated with Alexander Reinigal, manager of the city concerts. Dupart opened his own dancing school and published a collection of dances. And in the spring of 1792, Dupont's pupils danced minuets in the presence of President and Mrs. Washington. Duport wrote the music for these performances in a manuscript now in the Library of Congress, annotating them fancy dances. You will hear the minuet for Mrs. Washington, a minuet danced before Mrs. Washington, the choreography and music by Pierre Landrin Duport. about Washington's resignation. This reference is probably to Washington's resignation from command of the Continental Army in 1783, an emotional moment for all who served and the impact of which was felt for many years. Washington's resignation letter was written upon hearing the news that the Treaty of Paris had been signed effectively concluding the Revolutionary War while he was staying with Martha at Rockingham, the 18th century farm of Mrs. Berrien. Congress was then in session in Nassau Hall, Princeton, when the college town was the nation's capital for five months during the summer and fall of 1783. Soon after the war, dances named for Washington began to appear, and in 1788, dance master John Griffiths published Washington's Resignation in the earliest known printed collection of dances in the United States. From Washington's Rockingham letter, General Washington's farewell orders issued to the armies of the United States of America the second day of November, 1783, Rocky Hill, near Princeton. The United States in Congress assembled after giving the most honorable testimony to the merits of the federal armies and presenting them with the thanks of their country for their long, eminent, and faithful services. It only remains for the commander-in-chief to address himself once more, and that for the last time, to the armies of the United States however widely dispersed the individuals who compose them may be, and to bid them an affectionate, a long farewell. But before the commander-in-chief takes his final leave of those he holds most dear, he wishes to indulge himself a few moments in calling to mind a slight review of the past. With that in mind, listen to Washington's resignation.
the enslaved and free black musical experience. Singing, playing a musical instrument, fiddles and barrel drums, complex foot stomping, hand clapping in the absence of musical instruments or being banned from playing drums, and dances such as the West Indies Kalinda were also part of the enslaved and free black experience, expressing the daily life of arduous labor in the field or in a workshop as Cooper or Silversmith and spiritual belief. It is important for leading historic 18th century sites that figure in Revolutionary War narrative, such as the Washington residence Mount Vernon in Virginia, and even closer to home, Rockingham and the Trent House, to continue on the quest to share a more inclusive story on a path of understanding and awareness that is meaningful, relevant, and in a forthright manner. Addressing the presence of enslaved persons at both houses from a listing in William Trent's inventory of 11 enslaved people at the Trent House to Washington's valet, William Billy Lee at Rockingham. As we already know, Martha was born into Virginia's elite society and surrounded by enslaved people for her entire life. While he never publicly led the effort to abolish slavery, Washington did try to lead by setting an example. In his will, written several months before his death in December 1799, Washington left directions for the emancipation after Martha Washington's death of all the slaves that belonged to him. For two decades, William Lee accompanied Washington nearly everywhere. As manservant, Lee assisted his master throughout the Revolutionary War and thereafter. He was responsible for organizing the general's personal affairs. At Mount Vernon, when the retired president died, William Lee was the only slave freed directly in his will. And additionally, Washington provided Lee with an annual allowance of $30 for the rest of his life, noting, this I give him as a testimony of my sense of his attachment to me and for his faithful services during the Revolutionary War. Throughout the 18th century, broadsheet newspapers in America carry reports of runaway slaves, often from whence they fled, highlighting their skills in language, reading and writing, and playing musical instruments, especially the violin or fiddle. I am grateful to Sean Carney of the Trent House for sharing her research. There is a reference from an undated copy of the Pennsylvania Gazette to a Negro man, Bucks County, four miles above the Trenton Ferry, can play upon the fiddle. Mulatto Man, Monmouth County, listed in the New York Gazette for 1734, plays upon the violin. From the Virginia Gazette, an issue dated March 2, 1752, Guy, he plays on the violin, and Dick can play on the fiddle. Not all enslaved were runaways. There is a reference related to the College of New Jersey from a journal at Nassau Hall, March 18, 1786. A student recorded in his journal that he and his friends were having a glorious exercise, dancing up and down the entry while a Negro played upon the violin. We will hear a melody, The New Negro. This African black dance melody from the Whittier Perkins manuscript of violin tunes compiled in Boston, Massachusetts, circa 1790, and now at Rare Books and Special Collections at Columbia University, has a newly fit bass line by my colleague, Donovan Klotzbeecher. Here, the new Negro. <laughs> Pompey ran away. This selection is an example of African instrumentation blending with European airs from a collection published in Glasgow by James Aird, 1782. The piece features a melody associated with 18th century slaves that played on the African gourd instrument called a banjar, a forerunner of the banjo. Donovan has added a bass line to this jaunty melody as well. You will now hear Pompey ran away. Thank you. 
As cultural historian Velma Thomas Fan, whose book No Man Can Hinder Me, The Journey from Slavery to Emancipation Through Song, has written, under the weight of American slavery, it was the music that sustained, encouraged, and empowered them. It was this knowledge of the power of music, ritual of song and dance, that the enslaved Africans gave the world. The remarkable African Olida Equiano, 1745-1797, was born in the kingdom of Benin, southern Nigeria today, kidnapped as a child and sold in slavery. After careful saving and trading, he purchased his own freedom and later in London became involved in the movement to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. In his autobiography, 1789, he wrote of the importance of music in the lives of Africans. As Todd Judge of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation has written, we mourn sounds that have been lost, but celebrate what we've found. We, the practitioners of music, hope you have enjoyed our program, Nothing More Agreeable. We end the program where we began with music taken from a ballad opera, The Deserter, originally published in France and produced in France in 1769, the composer Monsieur Monsigny. The overture to The Deserter was justifiably famous, so much so that in the 1780s, Alexander Reinigal saw to it that his arrangement of the overture to The Deserter was published in Philadelphia. This is a very, very rare imprint, and we were very fortunate to be able to play from a copy in a private collection in Princeton that is literally identical to the copy owned by Nellie Park Custis. Again, music from The Deserter. And we thank you again so very, very much indeed. Good evening.